Welcome to all of you. My name is Jason Delborn. Um, I'm an associate professor in forestry and environmental resources and one of the cluster faculty in the Genetic Engineering and Society Center. Um, I see many old faces and a bunch of new faces, so I'm really uh, happy to see all of you here. As you know, we meet every week um, as part of our colloquium activities, um, and so you're always welcome. We publish our speakers through our newsletter. Um, thank you to Patty Mulligan for sending that out. Um, there's always good information about our speakers as well as opportunities to sign up for meetings with them or lunch with them, things like that. Um, we always start just with an opportunity to announce upcoming events um, or important issues for G the GES community. So anything, anybody have anything they want to announce? Nora. Uh, yeah, so the first GES write-in was this morning. And so for those of you who don't know, the write-in is just uh, a space to show up, open your computer, and get typed. No talking. Uh, so Jen and I were sharing the same room, and then I think Matthew and Adam were in, a, 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 in the adjacent room. Um, so it's really just about getting the structure you need uh, to get the writing done. Excellent. And so it'll be Tuesdays, 10.15 to 11.45. A great way to prep for colloquium. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to stop. Don, where is the uh, Room 2310, uh, which is right next to the Faculty Commons in D.H. Hill. But there's also lots of other space in there, so if on your way you get sidetracked to another space, take it. Uh, yes. <clears throat> I just want to welcome several of my STS 214 students uh -huh. who have come to join us in today's colloquium. They're getting extra credit for the engagement. <laughs> Excellent. Great way to see STS up close. <clears throat> Thanks for inviting your students and students, thanks for coming. You're always welcome. Even when it's not for extra credit, you're welcome. Rather, you just, looking just, for extra credit. Uh, yeah, yeah, extra credit for going on Thursday evening, 7.30, an author event. Uh, Teresa Ann Fowler, who wrote a well-behaved woman, will be speaking at Hunt Library um, about uh, this book about the Vanderbilts and about uh, women's suffrage. Great, thank you. And immediately before that, in Hill Library, um, Jay Taylor is going to be talking about the political economy and public lands. It's a stretch to call it a GES event, but it will be interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Please have a seat, Mark. Sorry for being a bit late. But it's okay. Um, so, uh, without further ado, let me just introduce today's speaker. Uh, this is Dr. Qian Xu. Uh, she's from Elon University, uh, and she's from the Department of Communications. Um, she focuses has focused on media analytics. And so the presentation today um, is looking at issues um, around GMOs in social media in the Chinese context. Um, I just want to say a couple of things. One is, uh, she just mentioned to me an, an interesting anecdote. She said, well, they might wonder, how did I get interested in GMOs in the first place? Um, she actually has a cousin in the Chinese National Academy of Sciences who has worked on genetically modified organisms. And those conversations really sparked her interest to take a look at uh, um, research in the communication field thinking about these issues. Um, and the second thing I'll just say is, you know, why th it's really wonderful to have you come here because I think we're all aware of how many ways um, that the Chinese political, economic, and scientific context intersects with the kinds of conversations that we have. Um, I'm just reminded that uh, I served on the, the Forest Biotech Committee at the National Academies, and we were, t we were, we were prepping for a briefing, and, and someone said, well, where are, are there any trees out there beyond... Um, you know, papaya and, uh, um, I can't remember the <laughs> um, papaya and plums and apples. Um, what, what about the forest trees? And, and, you know, one of our scientists said, well, we know that, we know that they have planted BT poplar in China, um, but that may be decreasing. We really don't know what the status is. Um, so there is this, I think, um, it's, a, it's a blind spot for GES um, that we don't have a better understanding of what's happening in the scientific um, and political context in China. And so this is one window into understanding um, that landscape for us. So I'm really uh, appreciative of you coming today, um, and please uh, take it away. Thank you. I mean, thank you for uh, Dr. Dale Wong's introduction, and I really wanted to thank all of you to actually uh, be willing to spend an hour with me talking about the public understanding and discussion about GMO on social media in China. And also, I really appreciate the opportunity and consider this as a great honor for me 
uh, somebody from communications talking in front of such a huge group of experts in biotechnology and also genetic engineering about public <coughs> understanding of it. So before I'm going to actually talk about anything, I think I wanted to use a personal anecdote to explain why I started to become really interested in this area. So as uh, Dr. Delbron uh, has actually mentioned uh, earlier, I have a cousin who actually works as a research uh, scientist in the Chinese National uh, Academy of Science. And her particular area is about genetically modified rice, the application of uh, GM technology in agriculture sciences. And we, uh, as a family, we actually talk a lot about the things you know, happening in our life on social media, especially with a mobile social media that is called WeChat. However, within our small circle of family, we do see some of our relatives, close relatives, remote relatives, they question about the validity of GM technology. They ask a lot of questions about whether this is considered as a GM modified product or produce or crops. Is it safe to eat it or not? And I think my cousin has actually been trying very, very hard to explain what's going on and also to actually demystify a lot of the myths and misconception about the whole thing. And then one day I started to actually have a talk with her. So if we are having such a big hard time to explain to people we are close to what this is about, think about all the general public and also the mass in China. Would they be able to really understand what's going on? Do they trust in this, uh, the research and development and also the findings in scientific field? That actually sparked my interest in this uh, area. So I have done several studies in the area about public communication and also public understanding about GMO. And actually very recently, we are actually continuing some more efforts collecting further data via uh, several Chinese social media platforms. But before I'm going to talk about my research, I wanted to ask you a question so that I would be able to know a little bit about the people in this room as well. So speaking of China and GMO, what are the things that would come to your mind immediately? Uh-huh. Anything? Yes? Um, food safety scandals repeated. Yes, food safety scandals repeated. Yes, exactly. That's why when you actually mentioned uh, the keyword strategy, that is essentially GMO in China, and do the search on social media, you will find a lot of posts are really about the food. Anything else? Greenpeace. Greenpeace, yes. That's also <coughs> one organization that I'm actually going to briefly mention in the role of actually dissemin uh, disseminating some of the information and how they have actually been uh, regarded by Chinese public. Anything else? Yes. Uh, what comes to my mind is a black box. Black box? I just don't know, and especially don't know about the government regulation mm -hmm. or oversight. And just a lot of don't know about how higher education works in China. Mm -hmm. So just a black box. And also I have to say for a lot of Chinese general public, the field of GMO is also a black box. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the information, especially scientific information, unless it's conveyed via the mainstream media owned by the state government, uh, they are not necessarily there are there are not a lot of things available there out there. <clears throat> product lines, specifically genetically modified grains. Yes. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, on the real like GMO worker side, the research from China seems really strong and very interesting. The the theoretical research, yeah, the mm -hmm. small GM experiments that don't necessarily get applied. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, because definitely, uh, as I'm going to mention later, since 2014, uh, the central government has actually invested billions of dollars supporting the related research, both at the theory, theory level and also at the uh, application practical levels. A little bit of scientific economic ruthlessness. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Babies. Yes, exactly. I'm actually waiting for people to mention that. And the reason I'm saying that I'm waiting for people to mention that is uh, my two of my collaborators, one in Central Florida and the other one in uh, Hong Kong Baptist University, we actually just finished collecting uh, all the um, posts on one of the most prominent uh, native Chinese social media, uh, Xinhua Weibo. 
uh, about this particular event. So, but we haven't done anything yet. So I hope we will discover something interesting. That's really um, a topic on the burner, I have to say. So, okay. Uh, without further ado, I wanted to actually uh, first provide some general uh, background about the GMO in China. Uh, as one of the uh, fifth largest, uh, uh, as one of the country with uh, probably one fifth of the world population, uh, together with uh, less than 10% of the world's arable land. Chinese government has been very enthusiastic in supporting uh, research and also development in the biotechnology field and also uh, genetic engineering. Uh, as I mentioned before, since 2014, billions of dollars have actually invested in this in these fields. And therefore, it's probably not surprising that uh, government actually initiated some of the media campaigns trying to promote the positive perception about genetic crops and also genetic products, even a little bit about the technology itself in China. Uh, even though China has already designated biotechnology as one of the key strategic industries, uh, not, I mean, I would say in the past five year plan and also in the next five year plan. It has been very cautious about actually pushing the field forward, especially the approval for cultivation of GM foods or feed crops. One of the primary reasons the government has been particularly cautious about that is because of the public I would say, opinions that have actually been showing, that have actually been uh, collected, being aware of, that in general current, I would say, citizens in China showed a relatively negative reaction towards what government actually really wanted to do. And actually last night, while I was actually preparing for this presentation, I was reading some news about that potentially in spring of 2019, Chinese government may actually take an important lead to the approval of cultivation of several species uh, of crops uh, especially that is GM, uh, genetically modified, and this actually has already started some heated conversation on social media about uh, whether this should happen or not. So that's the general, I would say, uh, context of what, about what's going on in terms of government support about genetically modified organisms and also products. And uh, Dr. Lu and also Chen uh, in China, they actually analyzed a series of surveys that have actually been conducted, conducted over the past 20, 30 years. And the U, therefore, they actually developed the framework for people to really understand the perception of public risk in terms of genetically modified organisms in China. And what they have been doing is they used a, um, a model developed by Slovak trying to address the risk perception from two perspectives or two dimensions. One is the so-called dread risk, the feeling that you can control the risk or you don't really have that much control. And the other dimension is about your knowledge, your awareness of the risk, to what extent that you understand it, how much information you have about it. So along those two dimensions, uh, they actually help us develop some uh, three phases uh, help us to really understand what's going on in public perception in China or Chinese public perception about GMO, biotechnology, genetic engineering in general. So in the last decade of uh, the, the 20th century, what's going on is people knew little about the relevant field for several reasons. In general, uh, scientists were not really talking about it in front of the public and media did not actually cover anything about it. And the only thing that they know about it was actually from, I would say, word of mouth or personal communication. So that is considered as a phase where we see an ignorance of risk. Uh, that is ha that was happening. So to some extent, people actually demonstrated a lot of blind trust uh, in uh, biotechnology, in genetic engineering. And at that particular, I would say, phase, you can see that people did not feel about the risk and did not feel that it's not entirely controllable at all. But then, I would say starting from 2000, uh, the next 10 years, 
people started to gain more knowledge about the field from, uh, I would say, the state media, the mainstream media. And also government was actually starting to use media to actually spread more information, trying to actually increase more awareness about the GMO and the technology, and also how important it's actually uh, part of the national strategic plan. So at that time, people were still very tolerant about the risk even though they started to know about, I would say, the benefits and also the risks. But to some extent, I would say moral acceptance, expectations for benefits, and also, more importantly, the trust in government's ability to regulate and manage actually help them to actually really be okay with the risk that they actually perceive from the media, from uh, people that they interact with associated with GMO. And the last phase, the one that we are experiencing right now, what's going on is people started to be more aware of the risk. And people also showed a, I mean, a significant level of increase or increased the level of concern about the risks. To what extent I would be able to, or the general, the society, the government, the, uh, the entire country uh, is able to control it or not. That is what we are facing nowadays in China in terms of public perception and reaction towards GMO. That's why people have become really, really mindful of the risk. And that's also why we are seeing so many, I would say, public debates happening on social media about, I would say, uh, GMO in China. This essentially serves as an important context, I mean, for my current study, for this particular study that I'm going to report here, uh, because it provides an important theoretical lens for some of the uh, interpretation and also implication of the findings. Given this particular context, I wanted to actually provide some additional um, uh, evidence in terms of how skept skeptical people are actually, or especially the general public, are about the GMO and what's going on in this industry in China. Uh, several recent surveys have already <laughs> shown that close to half of the population, they oppose the commercialization of GMO foods, <clears throat> even though they don't really know much about how it was produced, or knowing the, the important science effects associated with that. They just show, uh, I would say, the untrustworthiness towards the whole industry. Uh, second, they were also suspicious about uh, the impact of GMO on the society uh, at, uh, as well as on the individual levels. And uh, before this study, uh, my collaborator and I actually did a content an analysis of all social media posts uh, that actually happened in the year of 2014. Uh, almost half of them were actually negatively balanced in terms of how people were talking about GMO. However, we did find something that is a little bit different from the skepticism that have actually been circulating, that have been discovered by people in the current study. That's why I, am, I actually would have wanted to actually jump into the particular platform we studied about uh, for this study. So uh, do we have anybody in this room heard about a social platform called Xinan Weibo? Yes, okay, great. So it's actually one of the most popular native social media in China. As many of you probably have heard about that in China, a lot of the social media that are popular in the United States were actually not accessible. Facebook, no. Twitter, no. YouTube, no. So Instagram, not really. And Gmail, if you're in China, you have to use a proxy to actually get access to your own account. So given that is the situation, native social media actually becomes the primary source for people to really engage in public debates, public discussion, and also, I would say, serves as the primary source of the exchange of information and build the issue-based network about the discussion for GMO. So uh, to some extent, I would say because of the popularity of Sina Weibo, it did actually provide, successfully provides an alternative channel for the general public to actually get access and also to freely express uh, their opinions in addition to the traditional mainstream media that only conveys what the government really wants to say. So it's considered as an important public sphere for people to really engage in meaningful civic discussion and also to actually initi uh, initiate some important civic activism as well. 
It also serves as an important platform for several important debates about uh, GMO, such as in 2012. I know I, I actually include the example of Chinese here, but I'm going to actually talk about it soon. In 2012, uh, the golden rice experiment in China, experiments in China, actually elicited a really serious range of conversation on Sina Weibo. And in 2014, the release of a very famous uh, documentary about GMO uh, produced by a very famous uh, television celebrity, Yong Yuan Cui, also actually happened. The debate also started on Sina Weibo which actually led to a very wide range impact on how Chinese actually react to uh, the whole field of GMO genetic engineering. And more recently, in 2016, the letter, the letter, what is the letter in 2016? Nobel laureates uh, letter supporting precision agriculture. That also actually elicited a lot of hot debates, I can say, uh, in China about GMO. And all those important debates actually started on Sina Weibo. That's why we decided to choose this as the platform to study about. An important, uh, I would say, type of users on Sina Weibo that we wanted to actually focus on are the so-called opinion leaders. In the field of communication, there is a very classic theory that is called a two-step flow theory. Even though people have been challenging about, I would say, the applicability of this theory in the modern world, but still we see some validity of this theory in, I would say, the social media sphere. Particularly, this theory argued that information first go from uh, media uh, to the opinion leaders who have some important position uh, in the society. It could actually be due to their reputation, their socioeconomic status, or any of the resources that they may have to make them unique hubs, informational hubs, that would have better access to information than the, uh, the rest of people in the society, or they have better means to distribute information. And then information is passed from those opinion leaders to the general public. So what's going on on social media is several things. First, traditionally, opinion leaders are defined and also identified by their social economic status or some other demographic variables. And also they are usually the ones that have, I would say, better or higher reputation in the society uh, that could actually be have uh, that could actually be more knowledgeable about the subject matter than the other individuals. And also they have a better access or easier access to the resources than the regular people. However, on social media, that's no longer the case. Those are not necessarily the real opinion leaders. Who are the opinion leaders then? The ones who has ability to influence the flow of information. In other words, they do not have to be super rich. They do not have to be super powerful. They do not have to necessarily have the better access to information in the traditional, uh, I would say, platforms. Because social media does provide some different opportunities for people to really share the information, to obtain the information, to process and create information in different ways. So those individuals with strategic positions in this GMO issue-based discussion network are the individuals that we wanted to study because they are not only uh, the starter of those public debates and conversation about GMO in the previous examples that I have just mentioned in 2012, 2014, 2016. They are also the individuals who are significantly influ influencing the information dissemination on Weibo about GMO. So we look at their influences from two perspectives. The first one is through their identity some attributes associated with the nature of them being the sources of information. And the other aspect that we actually studied is about how they talk about GMOs. And in communications, we have a theory that is very well established and very well studied uh, that is called the framing theory. It essentially looks at how people select certain aspects to talk about a topic or talk about a subject matter. And through this process, they highlight certain aspects of a topic and while ignoring the others, that essentially changes the way 
how you perceive the subject matter or the topic itself. Given that is the situation, in our previous uh, project and also several other, I would say, projects in science communication or projects about controversial sciences, we have identified several salient frames that have been very often used to actually uh, to address the topic of GMO, such as risk opportunity, and also balance of attitude, and also geographic perspectives uh, within China or actually to a broader global community, and also fact and opinion. That has always been a hot topic, I would say, in science communication. So we look at how they select. I mean, they selectively actually use those frames to talk about GMO on social media. And so those are the two things we actually try to use to actually figure out how they influence people. Uh, another thing I really wanted to highlight is on Sina Weibo, uh, you actually can go through a verification process, a mechanism, so that uh, the platform will display you as a verified user to some extent, this is actually a credibility of this IQ that tells people this is a real person or this is a real organization. The blue one, the blue icon actually shows the official verification for organizational accounts. So any government, uh, I would say uh, companies, media, and also nonprofit organizations, they go through verification through that mechanism, which is very actually difficult. Uh, as an individual, if you will be able to submit some identifiable information, you will also be able to get a badge like that. Uh, so this is an important uh, piece of information uh, associated with uh, the identity of uh, the opinion leader. Uh, there are three different ways for people to actually engage in public uh, discussion of the content about GMO on social media on Xinjiang Weibo. Uh, I know it's hard for you to read the Chinese in here, but I think the icons will probably give you some idea about what those functions are. It's really about, this is like, comment, and also share or repost. So even though, I mean, people have actually been referring to all of them, all three of them, uh, as the measures and metrics, and also, I would say, the indicators of user engagement in content, they carry different meanings. And those different meanings are really something that we wanted to actually differentiate and also address in this particular study. So like is the one that shows uh, the valence of the attitude, even though it's probably the least effortful. You don't really have to do that much to actually click that button. On the other hand, for comment, it involves more cognitive effort. You really have to think about what you wanted to talk to the original, uh, I would say, author of the post. <coughs> And it also serves as an indicator showing how you are actually interacting with the original post, even though that's not necessarily seen by all your followers. So because of that, we would argue that repost or share involves even more mental effort. Because when you actually share an original post, uh, you are not necessarily only just passing on the information. It's also part of the self-management uh, strategy because people will be able to see what you are sharing and also what kind of things you are sharing. That essentially tells people a lot about who you are. So that's why we think that they represent the discrete levels of engagement. And it's important for us to separate them rather than just lumping them together and saying that, okay, here's the engagement. And we wanted to actually use source attributes and also message features to actually predict them. Uh, we collected the data by using the Nobel laureate's letter supporting pre, uh, precision agriculture as a triggering event. And we've collected all the uh, posts on Weibo containing the keywords of GMO, Zhuangzi, three months after this particular triggering event. And there are several reasons why we decided to actually uh, use this as a triggering event. First, uh, think about the context I just mentioned about the uh, Suspicion, perceived risk associated with GMO that is happening among the general public in the society in China right now. Uh, this is a one that is actually showing really strong support and also positivity about what's going on in this industry. So uh, after initial exploration, we have seen like a huge surge amount of uh, about posts that are that what happening on social media. 
So that's definitely actually going to change the public discourse. That's what we are assuming at that time. Uh, in addition, this particular event received so much media attention in China, uh, especially among the mainstream media. And therefore, this is more, I would say, this was more aware by the general public than I would say some of the technology or some science news that were actually released before actually very soon after that. So we think, we thought that this would be a really good timing to collect the information. So how we did it? First, uh, we actually built the mention-based discussion network uh, by using the social network analysis. So we identified the key players, or I should say the Weibo account owners, who had been mentioned by other people, especially when they actually talked about or mentioned GMO in their Weibo posts. And then we build connection between those accounts as the so-called conversational ties, conversational ties about GMO. And then we actually calculated the between its centrality of all those accounts to actually figure out to what extent they are central to the maintaining of this GMO issue-based discussion network. So I'm using this example to show what really between its centrality is about. If we take a look at this particular graph, uh, the green dot and also the red dot are actually critical in the dissemination of the information or the circulation of the information among those blue dots and gray dots. So in other words, if we take out either the green dot or the, the red dot, the bridges between people will actually be taken away. So they are no longer connected. Then the conversation probably will just exist at the individual level or the small group level. So here, when we talk about those 40 accounts, they are the ones that are actually uh, with those kinds of important and strategic positions bridging different individuals on Weibo, uh, uh, especially about uh, sharing the information about GMO and also the information about the letter. Initially, we actually collected and also we decided to go with the 50 top, top 50 accounts. However, uh, after further exploration, we discovered nine accounts mentioned or used the word GMO, but didn't really talk about GMO. They just used the term to refer to uh, something else. So we decided to actually take them uh, out from our research list. The second step, after identifying the opinion leaders, we collected all their tweets uh, posted during the three months after the release of the letter. And, uh, and after figuring out the unrelated uh, the, uh, posts, we actually obtained uh, more than uh, 60, uh, 600 tweets, uh, posts from those opinion leaders. On average, those are the numbers showing the number of comments, uh, likes, and also, uh, I would say, the number of reposts that each of them actually receive uh, on average. It's a pretty healthy number, so we I think that gives us enough information to actually research about. So for source attributes, I wanted to actually explain a little bit about how we actually content coded them. For account type, whether it's owned by an individual, ordinary user, or it's actually part of an organizational account. And also for the account verifications, you remember uh, the two icons that I showed, uh, individual account, and this one is about the verification of uh, the organizational account. In addition to that, we found actually among all of the organizational accounts, uh, 18 of them, the media accounts. In other words, the accounts, social media accounts owned by traditional media, or online media or offline media. And the other two, guess what they, are, they were? One is Greenpeace. The other one is US Embassy in China. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the really key organizational opinion leaders in this whole conversation. Uh, so we decided we should probably further break them down into the particular media type that, and to see how they may influence uh, the discussion or the engagement. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, so frames, for message frames, uh, those are the ones that we actually use and we go through the intercoder reliability. They are all reliable. So since I only have five minutes, I want to quickly jump to really the interesting things, the findings. So uh, the number of reposts and comments are probably considered as the more in-depth engagement since they involve more effort and also more cognitive or mental efforts 
than simply just clicking a liking button. Here's something interesting. Uh, first, organizational accounts did lead to more reposts than the individual account or accounts. And also, organizational accounts did lead to greater number of comments. And also, I would say the online news portals compared to non-media accounts also lead to greater number of comments. What does that mean? It seems that organizational accounts are or were able to engage the public at a deeper level. However, I would say account verification and also television and also online news reports only influence, I would say, the surface level of engagement among the general public of liking. But whether the account was verified or not, and also whether television served as, I would say, the source of the information didn't really influence the deeper level of user engagement in this conversation at all. Also, we talked about message frames. What are the important fra frames that were making a difference? Fact, facts. If they did use facts, especially verifiable facts, statistics, numbers, and also scientific evidences, apparently they did too. They did actually prompt people to actually share it more. And also, some interest, something really interesting here is anti-GMO posts or anti-GMO frame did not actually win this time. People actually were more willing to share, were more willing to comment, and also were more willing to actually show positive attitude towards it by clicking liking. If the opinion leaders actually talked about something more positive about GMO, The similar pattern can actually be found about uh, whether they are talking about, and also they mentioned about the risks of an opportunity. So only, I would say, the opportunity frame actually successfully predicted the uh, likelihood to share and also the likelihood to comment. Even though we do see some, I would say, negative impact on the mentioning of risks in those posts on the number of comments, but that was the only significant in fact, for the mention of risks associated with GMO. And finally, international frame. If the post mentioned anything in the global community, it's more likely to be shared and also commented. And we didn't see that of using China as a focus or the frame in how they actually created or actually crafted uh, the social media message, which is actually very interesting. Probably shows Chinese also uh, also care a lot about uh, what's going on in the world, the rest of the world about it. We also look at the specific risks and opportunities. There are many of them. And the one that people really care about and actually led to a more public engagement is the mention of health risks. Even though it actually significantly decreased the user engagement, I mean, for all three levels, post, comment, and likes. On the other hand, if the post mentioned health opportunities, like the ones that have actually been talked about in the letter, it actually significantly boosted the user engagement at all three levels. Which we actually wonder might be uh, influenced really by the nature of the particular triggering event that we actually selected. So another thing that I really wanted to actually point out is the national security risk. Oh, sorry, the lack of management. Uh, at the very beginning, when we were going through, I would say, the three phases of public perception of risk associated with GMO in China, I mentioned right now people are really concerned about the ability to control it, really at the government level. And if the post actually mentioned the lack of control, lack of regulation, lack of management at the government level, it's more likely to be liked by people, I mean, during our sample, I mean, within our sample. So what are the major takeaways? First, we really have to interpret those findings with a grain of salt. That is the triggering event that we chose. Because the event itself is really, really positive. So 
some of the findings that we see mentioning of opportunities, mentioning uh, or pro-GMO attitude potentially engaging people more because people probably were connecting what's going on on social media with what's going on, uh, what has actually been covered by the traditional media uh, off offline. And also, that's also that could also serve as one of the justification and the reason to explain why why we are also seeing a negative correlation or relationship between the mentioning of uh, I would say the health risks and also showing the anti-GMO attitude uh, was actually associated with the decrease the engagement. Uh, in addition to that, right, real identity I mean did matter, but they only mattered for the surface level engagement rather than the deeper level of engagement. Uh, in addition, well, there were always conversations about who was, uh, who is more powerful, individuals or organizations. In this particular situation, organizations, especially media, Greenpeace, and also US embassy in China, they seemed to be definitely more powerful than the regular user to influence engagement in this particular topic. And uh, finally, we really wanted to emphasize that here, facts seem to be more effective in engaging users in actually in the content uh, about GMO than uh, opinion. So those are the major takeaways of the study. Uh, so that's about my presentation. And I wanted to see, open the floor to any questions you may have. Thank you. Geographic context where you found that um, it seemed to overall be positive for GMOs if it was mentioned in terms of some international aspect. Um, in a lot of other areas, I think it might be the reverse. GMOs are can be seen as something that is inflicted by people from outside on a particular country. Um, do you have maybe any more detail about the perspective that people in China have about that? And I really wanted to actually highlight one thing here. Here, when we talk about the influence, positive influence of the international community, we are really talking about their effects on um, sharing or reposting and commenting. However, one thing that we really needed to bear in mind is reposting and commenting only shows the informational value. We don't really actually know whether the comments were positive or negative about GMO and whether actually people were sharing this particular post because they agree or disagree with the original intention or motivation involved in the post. So to some extent, I would be a little bit hesitant to say that the mentioning of the international community would actually lead to more favorable attitude toward the GMO. But it did actually successfully engage people more in this topic. And there are a couple of reasons. The first, if we think about the triggering event, the publication, the release of the supporting letter. And many of, I would say, the stakeholders in this particular event, they were from outside. So to some extent, people were actually looking forward to and also trying to wait to hear if people outside of the China potentially would actually do something different from what they have already been able to receive information from inside China. This is one thing. And another thing that may also offer some explanation for this particular effect is I have mentioned that people are actually in China right now, we are at the phase, people started to actually lose trust or we are seeing a decrease the trust in the government in uh, regulating and also managing this whole business or whole industry and also the research and development. Uh, given that is the situation, lack of the phase in the government potentially could actually lead to more conversation of seeking some external, I would say, entities or stakeholders that potentially would change the situation or make a difference, I would say, inside China. So that's my interpretation about why there's such a significant correlation between the two. So could, could you possibly identify who specifically some of these particular opinion leaders are? Yes, we were able to identify uh, all of them. Uh, for the regular users, a lot of them are really just the regular users, not ra rather than I would say the celebrity or really famous people uh, in the society. 
And also for the organizations, we had actually uh, 18 organizations. 16 of them are actually media-related accounts, and two of them are actually organizational ones. One is U.S. Embassy in China, and the other one is Greenpeace. And they actually, especially Greenpeace, was probably the top organization uh, that actually published a lot on Chinese social media about GMO. Go ahead. So, my understanding of the media in China is that it, there's a lot of regulation about yes. what can be said and how mm -hmm. things can be said. So, six, if 16 of the influential accounts in the media, is that a proxy for the government, or is that, I mean, how, do, how should you view that? Or I think that's an excellent question. I would consider them as the proxies of uh, the central government. Mm -hmm. However, surprisingly, <coughs> they were not really the top contributors of the postings about GMO on social media. Mm -hmm. Many of them probably just contribute, uh, I would say, no more than five posts over the entire three, uh, three months period. Mm -hmm. So even though I would say they are influential, we probably would say they were influential, not because of the number of information they were distributing, but more about, I would say, their own identity. Yes? So in China, you, for Sinoeva, you don't have to have a designated amount of followers or be some <laughs> celebrity status to be verified? No, you don't have to. You do need to have a certain number of followers to be, and also followees, and also number of posts to be verified. But that number is very easily obtainable. Okay, so yeah, it's very, not, very easily. It's not like Twitter where they kind of act like gatekeepers of who gets the blue check because you have to be like certain amount of famous to, to actually obtain that. Yeah, you definitely have to, to actually get a certain amount of fame before you can actually be verified. But let's say if you would be able to be followed by, I think based on the most recent criteria established by Sina, it was probably a hundred followers. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. a lot different yeah. than Twitter. So that's very different. <laughs> uh, but for the organizational accounts, their verification process is a lot more complicated. And also, I would say a lot more strict. You have to submit a lot of materials. Okay. Yeah. Just a technical question, and you're, you asked the, the, or made the point that it's difficult to assess the value, like in the comments, whether they're positive or negative. Is it possible to link, you know, if somebody likes a, a post and then also makes a comment, that's a pretty strong indicator of yes. a positive aspect. Mm -hmm. So are you able to, to see that in the data that you're using? That's an excellent suggestion. Uh, we didn't do it in this particular study, but we are thinking about probably doing uh, the more, uh, uh, the deeper level of analysis. And one thing that we are actually doing right now is actually trying to look at the consistency of the valence of the content and also the original post. And also to some extent that potentially could also address one uh, bigger question about whether social media actually served as, or serves, especially let's say China in this particular context, may serve as the echo chamber of information. And to what extent that actually is going to change the, uh, the whole conversation about GMO. So I think I wanted to follow up on your question here and ask a little bit more about those individual accounts sure. uh, and who they were um, and how you see them positioned uh, in the Chinese society mm -hmm. more generally. So a couple of weeks ago, we had um, somebody on campus uh, who was basically working for PR for Monsanto, mm -hmm. and he outlined for us that they are kind of purposely trying to cultivate opinion leaders, yeah. so yeah. they're looking for you know regular yeah. people who they yeah. can position in the podcast world and things like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I wondered about their individual sphere. Because I'm in communications, mm -hmm. I also, even in my class, I teach about the uh, how we will be able to identify opinion leaders, mm -hmm. especially if they are the regular users. Mm -hmm. Even I would say in the United States, they are considered as more influential nowadays mm -hmm. because people actually generate less emotional reactions towards what they say mm -hmm. uh, compared to organizational accounts, especially when they actually show the more obvious persuasive int intent. Uh, many of the individual uh, accounts that we were able to actually include in this study, uh, they include, I would say, scientists. Uh, they include, I would say, also regular people in some really unrelated fields uh, to GMO at all. And also we have some writers. We have actually a lot of writers, uh, fiction, non-fiction writers. Uh, that have actually been followed by a lot of people. They had no expertise about GMO at all, and many of them were actually 
saying uh, something that doesn't make sense at all about GMO. But somehow, I mean, their posts actually were pretty successful in engaging general public, even though they were probably were not as successful as organizational accounts. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if Weibo has the issue that Twitter does with, with bot accounts. Yes. that are um, trying to influence and I know that last year there were some articles about Russia trying to influence US opinion toward GMOs and while a bot account by itself might not generate have that many followers as a group um, they can influence opinion you know a hundred bots posted the same thing did you see any of that happening yeah when we were actually initially collecting all the data we did actually uh, found a lot of bots but we excluded them before we even started to actually identify the opinion leaders. Remember, when we were identifying the opinion leaders, we used the mention. A lot of the bots, they were very productive in creating the message or sharing the message, but they actually did not receive that much engagement in terms of liking, commenting, or I would say, uh, reposting or sharing. So in other words, they were actually really just, uh, uh, how should I say? they were actually masking themselves as the real users uh, by sending, a lot, sending out a lot of information. However, I don't think their information was very successful in terms of the information uh, relay. Uh, that therefore, we did not actually include any of them as opinion leaders because they didn't serve as a bridge to connect the communication. What type of people in China are on Weibo? Is it a Broad swath or very broad, educated? very, very broad. Yeah. Like my mom, who is actually 68, <laughs> uh, and she owns her own Weibo account. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, we have, I would say, some very young, like, um, I would say, primary school students. They own Weibo accounts as well. And I, I think in China, a lot of the social accounts were not as strict in terms of the age and also, I would say, who can actually access it. Uh, especially compared to Facebook here. Um, I want to I want to talk about the fact and opinion difference, mm -hmm. but first I want to understand how you coded that. So what what are what's the difference that you're picking up between fact and opinion? For fact, we actually coded if uh, it's verifiable. In other words, if there's any evidence, we can actually tell if it's true or not. This is one thing, and the other thing is if it uses uh, statistics. Uh, scientific evidence and also things, let's say, if it didn't really touch upon the technology itself, but it mentioned certain things that have been referred to or mentioned in the letter. And it's, it will be easy for us to tell if, if it's, it, it's something that we can verify or not. So we use that as a way to uh, differentiate, to identify the facts. For the opinion, I would say if it's purely just expression of feeling, and also, I would say, uh, somewhat general attitude, but really doesn't actually uh, provide, I would say, or touch upon the essence of the topic itself. And also, if it's not verifiable, uh, we actually decided to actually code it as opinion. Um, be uh, because on one hand, that looks like an optimistic um, result that, oh, we have a rational public who's dismissing opinion and paying attention to facts. But the way that you're defining facts, it could be that they're more like factoids than facts. Yes. So um, they become sh very shareable. They look like they're a firm piece of information, but really they're just like an ideological token. Yes. Um, referring to, right. you know, both, both sides in, in the United States have the standard studies that they mm -hmm. refer to. Those would be, and they're, um, those, those studies may not prove they may not be rationally processed, they're more like identity symbols about um, who, which scientists you put forward. So that would be factual, but yes. it doesn't really raise the quality of the public debate or maybe even public yep. understanding. This is actually, we realized that after we actually finished the, the analysis <laughs> and the study, and we consider that as a limitation of this project. And actually, I wanted to actually uh, catch everybody's attention to one thing here. So when we talked about fact of opinion, we didn't see any fact of opinion only, or fact only. So what is the baseline here? The baseline is a combination or mix of fact and opinion. So what we are trying to actually compare the effect is compare fact to a mixture of fact opinion, and to compare opinion to a mixture of fact opinion. 
I think that may actually uh, address your question uh, about what we are really essentially assessing and we are actually addressing here. It's, it's an ambition. Um, I understand the limitations of automated processing of massive amount of materials, but it's a great ambition to try to do a quality of discourse yes, um, probe in addition yeah. to just um, how things are spreading based on relationships and social status. So, definitely, definitely. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I, I want to follow up on the verifiable. So um, when you say it's verifiable, you know, I can say the city of Denver is on the boat. That is a fact that can be verified and it happens to not be true. So when you say verifiable, do you mean a statement? It could be true, it could be not true, but you can test that. No, only the true one. Okay, so verifiable, you mean yeah. true facts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so some things here, if you talk about GMOs, are, are almost synonymous with the broader topic. Like if you search posts about GMOs, probably the majority of them will mention Roundup. Mm -hmm. um, did you find anything similar in the content of the messages you gathered? Like when people talk about GMOs, is there an example that they consistently come back to? Uh, I think we actually didn't really do systematic analysis of the, the real narratives included in the comments. I think that's what we wanted to do uh, for the next. And uh, I think that's very, very important because we know that even they actually make a comment that does not necessarily they agree, or that does not necessarily mean that they, they are in favor of uh, the attitude that has been expressed in the original one. So um, one thing that we have actually uh, seen that, that was happening quite a lot when people were mentioning about the health risks and health opportunities, they were actually talking about the offsprings how that is going to influence our children, and especially uh, the growth of the children and also the health of the children. Uh, that seems to be a bigger concern in terms of health opportunity and health risks. I have a question that might be somewhat personal. Did you have, did you expect anything from this study and were you surprised by any of your results? We were surprised that the pro-GMO frame uh, actually mm -hmm. Uh, was so powerful in actually influence public engagement, especially given our first study actually showed a lot of the posts on social media were negative, almost half of them. People raised all kinds of concerns about all kinds of all types of risks. And we thought that if uh, the original post was anti-GMO or they talked about the negative GMO, people would actually become more engaged or they wanted to actually throw in more ideas or thinking or thoughts. So I have to say the results, I mean, many of them were not consistent with originally we thought it might be, but that probably is more insightful for us. But again, we have to really admit maybe the choice of the triggering event is the one that potentially is going to change the way uh, how the, the findings actually were at that time. Just a quick follow-up on that. Did you try taking the U.S. Embassy out of the data and then see if that changed? I would we guess did. that they're pushing the pro-GMO. We, we did, yeah. not really. And yeah. we actually tried to take a green piece out as well. And it didn't uh, change. No, not really. Hmm. Yeah. I wanted to ask, what do you suspect the long-term trends of this will look like? For example, what is the phase four of this? Do you think um, the populace is going to go very anti-intellectual, as we've seen in the U.S., or do you think the government will make it very pro-science? I think the government definitely will definitely uh, continue to actually support the science for sure. Very, very pro-science. And the other thing that uh, while we were collecting data that we see <coughs> that probably would be a future trend is a lot of the individual accounts that participated in uh, this uh, discussion, they were the scientists or I would say the science communicators. Uh, something that haven't actually been mentioned a lot in the previous studies about the GMO discussion in China. And they did not actually affiliate themselves with certain organization or certain research institute or university. They actually uh, label themselves as the so-called self-media. And even though they are still the individual accounts, but they have actually been taking uh, the huge responsibility of really explaining and demystify the misconception uh, or I would say misunderstanding about GMO. So, I mean, I, I hope those individuals probably will gain more prominence 
and be more influential on social media. And I would say probably in the next five years, we may see them as probably more influential uh, in engaging in general public in this conversation than the traditional media account, especially the online news portals or television. Please uh, join me in thank you. <laughs> Great questions and discussion. That's always a great part of colloquium. Next week, um, I believe we have Dr. Leon, who is actually oh, yeah. suggested that yes. we invite you and say a word about him. Um, he's in the weed science uh, department at NC State, and uh, we, Fred and uh, him and myself, have put in a proposal a while back to USDA, and he also responded with some comments to our to the Fred science paper about resistance uh, last year. Uh, <clears throat> gave some critical, useful feedback, and so we thought we'd get him in here to talk about some of his responses to that article and, and weed science in general. He knows a lot about Roundup more than anybody else I've, I've met so far. So. Okay, thank you. So hopefully we'll see you next week.